Congratulations, you aced the interview and secured a position as a junior network engineer within a large enterprise. You've been there for a couple of months and now you've been added to the on-call rotation. Everything seems to be running well with the network, but then the knock gets an alert that an important fiber link is down. You're the on-call for the network team, so that page is coming to you. You wake yourself up the rest of the way, you put some coffee on, you find some spare SFPs to take with you to the data center, then you hit the road. You get to the data center, find the correct switch, and you swap out an SFP, and then you go back and check the logs on the console. But much to your surprise, this SFP is not working. You work in a multi-vendor network environment, and all the SFPs you grab were HPs, but the switch you're working on is Cisco. The Cisco switch really only wants to work with Cisco Optics. Technically, any brand SFP will talk to any other brand SFP as long as of the right type. Now, there are ways to make non-vendor optics work in a switch. This is how you do it on the Cisco switch with this service unsupported transceiver command. Other vendors have similar commands to enable third-party optics. Now, the hypothetical junior engineer would never do this in a corporate environment that has support. He would go back and get the correct optics to fix this. This nasty gram from Cisco that shows up when you do this is enough to keep most enterprise folks from even risking and having a support issue. Now, just to head off a couple of potential comments from some experts out there. Yeah, if anything is important in the enterprise, you'd have more than one uplink. So one optic failing wouldn't cause some kind of catastrophe that you had to run and fix immediately. Nothing should go down. You should have some redundancy. We know that. Number two, yeah, this is a 3560 switch that I'm using as an example, which is in my home. No current funded enterprise is going to be running the 3560 anywhere. This video is going to focus on how that SFP validation works. That's all. Not about how to build an enterprise network. So just relax. I've been in the networking game for a while, and over the years there have been certain times where counterfeit SFPs have kind of hit the market. And I was always interested in trying to understand how these would get past the validation testing and show up as valid Cisco SFPs. I had the same question about third party optics, which it's nice. They're not saying they're Cisco. They're saying they're Cisco compatible. So they're not technically being counterfeit. But I wondered how that worked. When I saw that multiple vendors were selling these boxes where you could recode optics on your own and they would work, that super duper caught my interest because at that point, I really wanted to understand what was happening to the optic to make it compatible. I had a hunch that whatever these boxes were doing to these optics must have been happening via I squared C bus. Over the years, various errors and things like that, or just looking at certain logs on switches, I'd happened to see various I squared C messages. Also, in a previous life, I had worked in a TAC for a regional ISP, and I'd been involved in some kind of higher level debugging and troubleshooting with the ARIS on C4 CMTS units. And we got into the nitty gritty with a bunch of I squared C stuff related to optics on those. So I figured I squared C would be a good place to start looking. One day, a couple of years ago, I got my Google words just right and found this great blog post from this person. And it was exactly what I was looking for. It was all about hacking up a Raspberry Pi and using a Cisco twin gig adapter made for those larger X2 slots and using it as an interface to talk I squared C to an SFP. Not long after, I ordered a couple of these adapters off of eBay and added this promptly to my wish list of things to figure out how to do. And that leads us to today. Hey y'all, welcome back to the Hack Shack. So what we're gonna do today is take this equipment I just mentioned, a non-Cisco SFP, and see if I can use some of this information that I gather up to create or modify a non-Cisco SFP so that when I put it in my switch, the switch thinks it's an acceptable SFP and will allow it to work without having to use that service unsupported transceiver command. Let's see how it goes. So first things first, I peeled the little label back to expose the screws and then got the two already exposed screws loose so I could open up the case. Here you can see it out of the case with the two SFP slots on it. I'm gonna flip it over 
and I uh, thought this was interesting. Looks like an LG symbol. I wonder if that was the OEM that made these for Cisco. Here you can also see the resistor R57 and R54, which is where I'm going to put my I squared C cables. I'm just going to tack them there with a little bit of solder. You can also see on the card edge where we're going to solder a ground and 3.3 volt power from a Raspberry Pi. Here's where I'm first soldering to the I squared C points and then the ground and power soldering right here. Here I've got a Cisco SFP just showing you how that looks when it's connected to the port when it's outside of that enclosure. Here I'm using the Raspberry Pi GPIO pins one and six for power and ground and two and three for the I squared C connections. And here I'm just connecting the jumpers from the adapter to the jumpers I hooked to the Raspberry Pi. At this point, it was time to run the I2C detect command to see if the SFP was detected. And if it was detected properly, I would say a 5-0 and possibly a 5-1 here. But notice it's all dashes, so something was not working. As a baseline check, I grabbed a I squared C display of mine and connected it to the Raspberry Pi and ran the same command again. And you can see here it was detected as 3C. So this pointed to something being up with my soldering to the adapter. I ended up making a mess of that first board, so I ended up shucking the other adapter out and re-soldering it. And this is kind of what it looked like, and you can see how I've got it rigged up to this Raspberry Pi 2. With things re-soldered up, I ran the detect again with the Cisco SFPN, and now look, you can see 50 and 51 show up. And now when I query 50, you'll see that I can see the information that is on that SFP. At this point, I felt pretty good about things and was ready to try to move forward. I found this GitHub repository from a user named Lucas2511, and he had some pretty good looking scripts for messing with I squared C stuff. I went ahead and grabbed that from GitHub and pulled it down to my Raspberry Pi so I could check out his scripts. I then switched SFPs to put the non Cisco Finisar in that I was going to experiment with writing to, and I used this command to make a backup of it. And just running cat here to make sure I had that. I played around with some of the scripts that he had to try to like just mess with the vendor name or serial number just to write some goofy values to see if they would write and change. But uh, I tried several times and could not get that to work. If you look here I'm gonna see and it looks the same as it did before I tried my write and this was what happened several several times. Now, I'm not the brightest tool in the shed, and it took me quite a while, and I'm going to spare you from here. But the problem ended up being that this Finisar SFP was write protected. And if you look at the default unlock script from him, it's all zeros in those values, right? I cannot find the link as the time of I'm recording and preparing this video, but I will find it and put it in the description. I just happened upon some page with software that was used for unlocking things and it had a screenshot and in that screenshot it happened to have values where they were messed with a finisar just on a whim i took those values and placed them in my version of the unlock script you can see that in the bottom here and when i put those in the file and ran that it unlocked things and then i was able to write my goofy changes to the finisar and you can see that proof right here i really put some silly stuff in there and it took and when i did a read it was there. So when I'd gotten this far, I knew that I could read and write to an SFP. And now the big challenge was just trying to figure out the special sauce that Cisco uses to determine if it's a blessed SFP or not. This command here, show ID prom interface and then the interface name, in this case, gig 050. This is a command that actually from the Cisco device itself will give you a ton of output but one of those pieces of output is this right here and while I could do this on the Raspberry Pi rig up this is just another view and I'm going to be using this view to go through several things here in the next little bit but this shows you a complete dump of the parts of the SFP that we're going to need to manipulate this output is also important because this is the output of a valid Cisco Finisar approved SFP there are key values here that we will have to reference and look at and use to see if we figure out and understand how certain values are generated 
in order to be confident that we can fake things out. So buckle up. This is about to get kind of funky and be prepared to rewind and rewatch, but at least you won't have to go through a bunch of Russian forums and stuff like I did to figure this thing out. This portion is the vendor name and it can be anything, but in this case, it says Cisco Finisar and it's 16 bytes or characters. And that's why you see the 20s at the end that takes up the spaces that were not used. So to fully pad that out. The next section of interest is the serial number. Same thing. This could be whatever you want, really, as long as it's just 16 bytes or padded out to 16 bytes. This next value is what I'm going to call manufacturer ID, and it does matter. It's one byte. It's technically got two leading uh, bytes, but mainly one byte, and it's important because it signifies what pre-shared key that Cisco and the manufacturer agreed upon. If this value doesn't line up with the key that you use, things aren't going to work. This next value is an MD5 sum that is derived from that manufacturer's ID that I told you, the name, the serial, and then the special key that goes with that manufacturing ID. All those things are kind of concatenated together and there's an MD5 sum and that's what this is. These last four bytes are a CRC32 checksum that is reversed and I will show you how that's calculated, but it's important because this is also part of the, how the switch makes sure that's a valid SFP. To address the elephant in the room, I'm gonna talk about these secret keys, so to speak. I am not gonna show those keys. I had to look for those keys. They aren't that hard to find. If you follow some of the threads or comments on these links and resources I'm gonna provide, you can find a couple of keys like I did. Cisco obviously is aware that the cat is out of the bag on some of this stuff, especially this older equipment. So there's really nothing that's going to be slipping out that's not already known, but I'm not going to make a 100% turnkey how-to here. I'm trying to shoot for about a 99.9% .9 turnkey here. I'm just trying to scratch a personal technical itch, something that was I was very curious about and wanted to see if I could figure out how to do it myself. And that's where this video is, and I thought others may want to see that. I don't want to end up in Cisco jail or anything or get banned from Cisco live or anything like that. I've got no problems with Cisco. Okay. So after a bunch of trial and error, I was going to see if I understood the process correctly. And if I did and had the right key and stuff, I should be able to calculate the same MD5 value and the same checksum value that the legit Cisco SFP shows if I used its other values to generate those. Okay, here's where I'm doing the MD5 calculation. I'm concatenating these strings shown with the hidden key at the end. And the result I get, let's see if it matches and it does match. So that proves that we understand how to generate a valid Cisco accepted SFP at this point. Well, almost. We need to check that CRC32 value as well. A valid CRC that'll work for the switch will be these strings here. It's the padded manufacturer ID, the MD5 sum from the previous step, and padded zeros all the way up until the last four bytes. This is the command I used in the shell to get the CRC32 value. And yes, that's right, that's gzip, which I thought was so funny to use it that way, but I saw a neat stack overflow answer where someone was wanting to use these command line to calculate CRC32 for a string, but didn't have a certain tool installed. And based on what they knew about gzip, it worked. And I just thought that was kind of neat. So I just decided to use that. Here's a close up of the CRC32 value we have with the CRC value that is in the SFP. Now notice how they're flipped around. That's the big thing. So after you calculate it, you have to just shift those bits and put them in backwards order. You don't flip around the hex itself, but each hex value just changes location. Now that we know for sure we can calculate the CRC and MD5 stuff properly, I wanted to give this a shot with some real values and try to write those to the non Cisco SFP to see if they would work. Based on the values that I'd already decided to use for serial number and manufacturer and all that stuff, I went ahead and calculated the MD5 value. And then from that, went ahead and also calculated the CRC32 value. 
here you can see the file that I'm going to use to write the values. Um, and you can see the vendor serial MD5 and CRC32 values. And it looks mostly the same except for down here where I write the MD5 and CRC. The thing I'm going to do is actually pipe that into SED so it'll just bump those out of line at a time because unlike the string characters, I'm not going to convert those to hex. I'm just going to write those in as they are. Here's where I'm running that file and pushing those changes to the SFP. I forgot one little byte I had to flip, so I needed to unlock it one more time, set that, but here's what the dump looked like after everything was written. Here you can see where I went back in the switch and turned off the unsupported transceiver command. And then when I do show run and look for it again, it does not show up. So there's no way that that's gonna be an issue. If I plug this in and it works, then it's working without needing that feature. At this point, I've got the module plugged back into the switch. I'm going to show here it's on 050. It is down because it's not linked up, but um, you can see it's properly detected. It doesn't say it's error disabled or anything like that. And now I'm going to do the show ID prom for that same interface 050. And you can see it sees all the information and knows the capabilities there. There still may be something I need to tweak a little bit, possibly, but you know, it looks like a legit thing but obviously my name is made up there and that model that part number is made up so you know it, it's not giving a hoot about what those values are i think mainly as long as the md5 and the crc is right and matches a key and manufacturer id that it's good to go also right here transceiver it can see the dom information light levels i mean it's not hooked to anything that's why that optical receive is negative 40 but you can see the temperature and the voltage so that sfp is doing just fine before we wrap up here, I wanted to make sure to mention a couple of things. One of them is CyberChef here. It's very cool. I use it a lot. It uh, is a nice web interface and will let you do all kinds of conversions of data in different directions. Uh, give it a look. It's kind of neat. This other thing gets back to the um, key question from earlier. And I found this neat page on GitHub where this person walks through how to basically disassemble and reverse a Cisco IOS binary firmware file. And just think about that for a minute. If it's a pre-share key, that software has to have it to be able to do its calculations to compare to what you're presenting to it when you stick an SFP in. So for anything that's old school-ish, kind of like that, those keys have to be inside that firmware somewhere. So just, you know, think about that for a minute and see if that's something that you might want to experiment with. Hey, if you made it this far, thanks for watching. Hope to see you again next time. Take care. Bye-bye.